Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good, Good to see everybody. Hey, my name is Matt Porritt. I am uh, a student pastor over at the St. Charles campus. Good to be here. I've been here a couple times, so I haven't met you. I'd love to meet you. Um, but it's always good to be back at, at Troy, uh, hanging out with you guys. Happy Father's Day to, to everybody. Hope everyone is doing good. Um, if you see a dad, pat him on the back and say, hey, happy Father's Day uh, to, to you guys. Um, in, in true Father's Day fashion, I thought I would start by sharing something that all fathers are into. And we're not talking about, you know, cooking out, not talking about grilling, not talking about working out, not even talking about cars. No, we're talking about the WNBA. I know that's what you're thinking. We're talking about the WNBA. Anyone seen uh, or anyone know who this lady is right here? Anyone have heard about this lady, Caitlin Clark? I thought this is a really manly, testosterone-filled way to start the message. But um, Caitlin Clark is, if you didn't know, she was just recently drafted, um, the, the number one overall pick in the WNBA to the Indiana Fever, which maybe you're just hearing that for the first time. We're not going to have much WNBA talk, but just here at the beginning, stick with me, all right? Um, so this young lady is, like, phenomenal. She is sensational. She's taken the league by storm, and now, like, there's eyes and money and people, more people watching the WNBA than ever has been before. Like, literally, if you turn on ESPN, you'll see ESPN is leading, like, their main shows talking about this young lady right here. Like, they're talking about Caitlin Clark and the things that she's doing in the WNBA, which is incredible. But there's a controversy that's happening because she is a rookie and the more seasoned veterans are kind of giving her a hard time. I don't know if you've heard about this, but they're fouling her like really, really hard, knocking her down. Even all the refs are calling like really ticky-tack fouls when literally everyone in the stands is here to see one person. They have one moneymaker and it's her. And like that's what people are here to see, see this lady like dominate on the court. But they have this problem is they're doing what you would say, uh, they're, they're, they're killing the golden goose, right? They're, they're biting the hand that feeds them. They're, they're messing with the money maker. If they would realize what has brought them this recent success, maybe those other veterans would say, ah, maybe we won't hurt her. Maybe we'll let her do her thing so that we can have more money as well. We've been going through a series about generosity and finances called Entrusted. We've done, uh, this is the last week of the series we talked about um, motive and method. We talked about responsibility and reward. And today we're talking about trust and trusted. Trust and tr trusted. And when it comes to money and, and success, we can kind of have that idea too that we don't want anyone to mess with our money. We don't want to mess with our money maker. But the thing is, is God kind of has something to say about the way we manage our money, right? And we've learned through the past two weeks that he actually doesn't have some things to say. He has a lot of things to say. So we're going to go uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. We'll go to the end of Timothy's or Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to have three mo movements in this sermon. We're going to talk about God being a trusted provider, how we are trusted stewards, and we should look forward to the trusted treasure. So let's go ahead and take off 1 Timothy Chapter 6, verse 17. Paul writes this. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. There's that phrase right here, as for the rich. And I don't know if you guys do this, but sometimes when I read the Bible, I have this temptation when, when Paul or Jesus, they like classify something. And then they say, um, to the men I say this, or to the women I say this, or to, to children I say this, or to elders I say this. And they have like, they're, they're addressing certain people. I have this way of just saying, okay, well, that doesn't apply to me. He's not talking to me here. And I think that's what we do, right? As for the rich. A good example of that would be when Jesus speaks to the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 18. You know what he says? He says, go and sell all of your possessions and give to the poor. And we read that, we say, oh, that was for him, not for me. And I think our temptation just coming to this passage, passage when we read this scripture, as for the rich, that's not me. 
You can check my wallet. You can check my bank account. You can check the car I rolled up in, except like those nine people who have those cars over there. Like maybe those people, maybe it applies to those people, but it doesn't apply to me. I'm not rich. That's the wrong guy. And and you know what? I, I understand, but maybe let me kind of press you on that just a little bit. Now, now certainly, there's probably not too many one percenters in in this room. And if there is, like, congratulations. But globally, I bet there's a lot of people who are in the top 25%. Uh, Nationally, actually, just just, um, uh, the the latest study on the the annual household income in Lincoln County. Lincoln County, it has a a, a good solid chunk uh, more than than the average household income income in America. So, so you guys, just by living in this area, are, are just by default most likely a little bit more well-off than the average American, believe it or, or not. And if you take it globally, you're in the top quarter. You're in the top 25%. And if you imagine, I'm not that great at math, but I think this checks out. Um, there's about 8 billion people on the planet. So that means that you, if you're in the top quarter, that you sitting in this room have more wealth, has more assets, have more money than 6 billion people. Maybe you haven't ever thought about it like that, but I feel like that might be the way that God sees it. When we come to this passage, maybe we shouldn't say, okay, he's not talking about me. He's talking about the one percenters. Maybe he is talking about us. But, but I'll give you it. Let, let's just pretend he's not talking about us. What do you think Paul would write if he was talking to um, those of the middle class, those of, of a median wealth. Do you think he would say, all right, for you guys who are not wealthy, but just kind of average, you guys hoard up everything for yourself. You guys don't be generous. You guys just, just trust in your average wealth. Does that sound like something he would say? I, I think he would probably say the same exact thing. Don't be haughty or set your hopes on the uncertainty of your wealth. So so regardless, it applies either way, whether we're rich or whether we're not. He says, don't trust on the uncertainty of riches. And and that is certainly true, right? Uh, It's easy to know, okay, like if I have $15, like I know what I can do with $15. I can go to Chick-fil-A and I get lunch and it's good. And that's certain, right? Until like Chick-fil-A raises their prices again, then maybe not. Um, Unless it's a Sunday as well, you can't do that either. But what is uncertain is this, is that you don't know what's going to happen to your money tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen at all tomorrow. In fact, you don't know what's happening outside of this room. And so it's so easy to trust our money and put our hope in whatever that dollar amount is that you see when you open up your bank uh, app, whatever that dollar amount that I- that is that is under your, your mattress if you're one of those guys, like whatever it is, like it's easy to trust in that because you know what it is, but you know ultimately what you are, are what you have is a limited supply, right? You have a limited supply, but it's so easy to trust in that. But we have a God who has an unlimited supply of resources. I think this is the reason why Paul, before he writes this, before he addresses the rich, he writes this poem about who God is, maybe to remind them how powerful, how blessed, and the resources that he has. And that's in um, verse 15. We'll pull that up there. Paul writes this. This is a poem written by Paul about Jesus. He says, He who is the blessed and the only sovereign, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can seem to him, be honor, eternal dominion. Amen. He says that. The next words, now to the rich. Do not set your hope in the uncertainty of riches, but on God, when you put those things back to back, you see what he's doing. Do you want to set your hope in that limited dollar amount that you see when you open up your bank account? Or do you want to set your hope in the trusted provider? 
knowing that whatever your, uh, your employer is, that that isn't the trusted provider, that you serve the trusted provider, and his name is Jesus. And he has endless, boundless resources that are available, and he is in control because he knows what's going to happen tomorrow, and he knows what's happening outside this room, unlike you and I. One of the main reasons why people don't give to the church, one of the main reasons why people aren't generous is, is this, is that they feel like they don't have enough money. I'm not for sure if I can give because then I'm left with only this percentage amount. I'm not for sure if I can increase my giving because then I'm not for sure if I could get by comfortably. I wonder how God looks at that. Uh, a few months ago, actually the, this whole year, my wife and I have been saving up to buy um, a, a new sectional. Actually, just a sectional for, for our downstairs basement. We, we'd, we'd saved up for a while. And, and, and we took our daughter, our seven-year-old daughter, to go shopping for this sectional. But it was just funny to hear her perception of money. And maybe you had a similar conversation with a child and their perception of, like, uh, you know, $100 is so much. And, and she was walking by um, the, these sofas and all this furniture and just seeing that, it, uh, that oh, the, the price tags don't just have three digits on them. They have four digits on them, right? It, it's like, it's in the thousands. She walked by something like, that is $3,000. No way. Like, that is that much. And, and she was walking through the store just eliminating all these. We can't get that. We can't get this. We can't get that. There's no way because she just assumed, like, there was no way that we had the resources that we were well off enough to, to afford something like that. And so it was just so funny. And we're like, Marlo, you got you to gotta calm down. Like, we have it. We've saved. Like, it's, it's going to be okay. And we ended up purchasing a sectional. It wasn't anything crazy expensive. But, but we bought one. And she, her mind was just blown by the price tag. I'm like, I can't believe you spent that much money. And I, and I wonder if maybe... God looks at the way that we think about finances kind of like that, right? There's no way I can do it. There's no way I can afford that. There's no way I can make it work to give a little bit more. And God's saying, looks at us like I would look, like, look at my, my daughter. I'm saying, there's no way, there's no way. I think maybe we perceive money in a similar way way. Um, so we talked about God being the trusted provider. The next one is that we are trusted stewards. We're going to go to verse 18. So those who are rich, verse 18, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. We're like, okay, those, those are all good, but then we get to that verse that's ready to share. That is, that's, that's kind of kind of not something that we do, right? Um, and Gus talked about last week, he used the passage in Acts where he talked about all the believers were one in heart, right? And they shared all of their possessions. You guys remember this? Um, he talked about literally like the earliest church that people would come and say, I have a house. You can have it. I have this income. Here is all my stuff. Let's use it for the church. And, and that was like the, the foundation, the generosity that the earliest church started on. And now I'm not going to do anything weird say, all right, guys, bring forward all of your, we're not doing that. But, but here's our difficulty. That culture is a lot different than the American culture that we're in right now, right? Because we are not, hey, we're all in this together. We are, it's about me and my immediate family unit. And I have to do anything I can to make sure that my family is good. And I'm not, and I, there's nothing wrong with that, but we always have family is first. And we talk about being ready to share. It's, it's, I'm taking from me, I'm taking from my family. That, that's hard. But my question would be, and, and, and just follow me on this, don't walk out. Do we view our money like Christians, or do we view our money like Americans? Americans say, I work for my dollar. It's mine. I earned it. I have it. I can do what I want. Whether that is for me or for my family, it is all good. Christians say, God has given me this money. Everything that I have is his. He has trusted it for me. I am not an owner of the money, but I am a steward. And I am to be generous as God has been generous to me. You see the big difference there, right? 
the way we work, they say, it's mine, I earn this, and I get it. And I think my temptation is this, is I know that that's true, but my heart says, in my flesh, no, but it's my money, right? No, but I worked, and it's mine. Like, to be ready to share, that's hard. And there's a difference between being ready and eager, right? Ask any of the parents in the room if what's the difference between being ready and eager. You ever ask your kid, are you ready to go? And they still take so long to go. I think what Paul is saying is not just to be ready to give, but to be eager to give. Not just waiting for an opportunity, but looking for an opportunity to give. What if this was the, the biggest tension at, at Troy Campus? What if this was the biggest tension point or pain point at, at Harvester? Was not whatever bitterness we have, but was about who was the one who got to give. When a need came up, when someone says, I need, my, my electric got turned off, I have a need, and the argument is, who gets to meet that need? Or when a kid says, I want to go to camp, I want to go to CIY move, I want to do that. The argument, the fight is, let me be the first one to meet the need because we are eager to give, we are eager to share. That's the picture that Paul is, pa is painting. Not that we're ready, oh, if someone comes. No, we're looking for an opportunity to be generous with the money that God has given us. Me and my wife, um, we, we give our kids allowance, just no judgment Anybody allowance people? I don't, I'm not for sure. Anyone allowance people? Okay, and maybe we're not. We give our, we give our kids allowance, and it's not, it's not that much. Um, it's not that much, but me and my wife have two different philosophies on this. So my wife, because she doesn't like junk, she likes to kind of manage and have her influence on the way the kids would spend their money. Like, she likes to do that. And me, because I want to teach them a lesson, I let them spend on whatever they want to. So if they want to spend, you know, $30 on slime, they can do it. If they want to spend $30 on all bubble gum, that's fine. I don't, if they want to spend $30 on Dr. Pepper, that's great. Like, I don't care how they spend it because, for me, it's about the lesson of them learning how to use their money. Sierra, it's about, no, I want to make sure they don't get something that's useless. And, and I understand, and it's really the debate that we have is this. Is the allowance, are our kids owners of the money, or are they stewards, right? Do they get to do whatever they want to do with it, or do they need to consider something else or someone else? And my friends, God has called us not to be owners, but God has called us to be stewards, meaning that he has given you the, the, your wealth, and you don't own that. It is not yours. He's called you to manage it in a way that honors and glorifies Christ and reflects his generosity. The second reason why people don't, don't give is this, is they feel like they are in a season of transition, right? And this is how life works. As I'm in a season of transition, maybe you're saying, I just got baptized and I just learned last week what a tithe is. Like, that's that's crazy, or, or maybe you're saying my job situation is changing, or we're in the middle of a move. Um, I'm not for sure what, what life's going to look like. My, my income has changed a little bit. I went to part-time, and or maybe I, like, I'm still a new Christian, or I'm not for sure. Like We're always in seasons of transition, so we say, I can't start giving until I figure that part out. And it makes sense, but my question is, do you stop being a steward in a transition? No, is there ever a time when, when Jesus says, all right, um, you know what? I'm in a transition time. I know we're in Jerusalem, but we have to get back up to Galilee. So now, as we take this journey, we're in a transition, so I'm not going to be generous now. I'm just going to put generosity on hold, put that in my pocket, and we're going to walk to Galilee. And once I get established and settled, then I'll be generous again. Does that sound like something Jesus would do? No, it doesn't, right? No, it doesn't. He... Just because you're in a period of transition doesn't mean God has um, uh, lifted the responsibility of being a steward off of you. The expectation is still there. The last point is this, is that because we are trusted stewards, because we have a trusted provider, we can trust in a trusted treasure. Verse 19 is this. Thus storing up for themselves 
a treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Paul here gets to the point. Why generosity? Why generosity? And the interesting part is that he says it's not for people outside of you. He says the reason is for storing up treasure for themselves, for the future, and for life. So he's saying the reason in generosity is actually beneficial to the person who is giving. That maybe perhaps God has some plans externally for your generosity, but maybe his most important plan is what he's going to be doing internally inside the giver. Does that make sense? Do you follow me? That God's plan in your generosity is both external, meaning he wants to bless other people with it, but he also wants to bless and increase your faith. On the screens, as, as, you, as we start a service, um, they, they, they put the words up there were the harvester vision. There's, there's three points to the harvester vision. There's encounter Jesus, um, unleash Jesus, and then there's become like Jesus. You guys have heard this language before, right? And becoming like Jesus is a big deal at Harvester. And our, our hope is that when you come and you sit in these pews or you sit in these chairs and you, and you come to small groups, that you would become like Jesus. That is our hope. And I would say perhaps, perhaps becoming like Jesus might require being generous. Do you think Perhaps becoming like Jesus might require being generous, considering he's the most generous person who's ever lived, that he who came and emptied himself completely, who gave us everything, who withheld nothing from us. Perhaps if we are supposed to become like that man, maybe we are supposed to increase in our generosity. Just maybe. He says, you store up for yourselves treasure. You store up for yourselves treasure for the future. And I would like to ask this question. What would it look like? What would it look like for you to increase your, your giving? What would it look like for you to increase your generosity? Maybe you're, 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 you're a consistent tither, and maybe you say, okay, I need to go from 10% to 11%. Man, that's awesome. Or, or maybe you're saying, you know, I've been trying to do like a soft tithe. I've been trying to do like just dipping my toe in the water, 5%. Maybe I need to jump up to 10, or maybe I need to jump up to 7.5. Like, what would that look like? And, and if you're a math person and, and that motivates you, that's, that's great. But for me, those numbers really do nothing for me. Um, when I ask that question of what would it look like, I mean, what ministry would happen that's not actually happening right now if you increase your giving? More specifically, whose life would be changed? What family would come in here and stick around and stay and be baptized there and go off to camp and follow, their, follow Jesus for the rest of their life if you increase your giving? What person in poverty would, would have a need met, would understand the grace of God if you decided to be generous? What child would be welcomed over there in the kids' ministry area, being shown love and being taught the gospel of Jesus and have their life changed if you decided that I could give a little bit more? What would it look like for you to increase your giving? The third reason why people don't give is that they don't trust the church. And this is a hard one. And for whatever reason, maybe... They've been burned by the church. Maybe financially, it's, it's just been, um, they just don't trust the church in that aspect. And I get it. And maybe that's you. And I understand there's hard feelings. I understand that the church and finances, at some point, it's been hard. And sometimes people think the church talks about money too much. I get that. But then also, you're here. You're sitting in chairs that belong to Harvester Christian Church. You're sitting under a teaching of Harvester Christian Church. You trust me and you trust Gustavo. You trust, trust Grant to help you spiritually form yourself. You trust us with your spiritual life. Moreover, several of you trust us with your children, that they are safe right now. That the workers in that room are safe and are kind and are loving and can teach them the truth. And my question would be, if you can trust us with the spiritual life and the safety of your children, why could you not trust the church with your money? 
Which is more important? A year's worth of tithe or the spiritual formation and the safety of your children? It's not even close. If you can trust us with your kids, you can trust the church with your money. And remember, it's not yours. It's his. The reason why those questions matter to me is because my life truly was changed by generosity. Um, when I was 17, I kind of, in my whole life, I kind of s- like stood in the shadows of my faith. Um, I went to church all the time, but I never really took a step out. And um, when I was 17, I went on, um, I was going to go on a mission trip. It was a mission trip at my ch- at my, um, that my church told us about, but no one from my church went. It was me, a 17-year-old guy, going to a mission trip to Peru with people I'd never met with another organization, and I had to raise $2,500 for the trip. And I did some fundraisers, and I did like some asking. I wrote some letters, and, and I raised a little bit of money, but as what happens with a 17-year-old, eventually the fire in me kind of started to dwindle, and uh, weeks went on and weeks went on. I didn't raise any money, and I thought, well, I guess I'm not going to go on this trip. I guess I'm just not going to tell anyone because I don't want the embarrassment of, like, I didn't raise the money. Um, and it got to the deadline. I remember going to church. It was a regular Sunday, and everything was fine. And then we walked out. And I was like, I guess it's fine. I guess I'm not going on this trip. And before I walked out, the lady who was in charge of missions came up to me and said, hey, Matt, uh, where are you at with, with your giving? And I was, like, crushed. Like, oh, man, I wanted to sneak out here. And, and just kind of no one talked to me about that. And I was like... You know, I have like half of the funds. I I know I need more. Um, You know, I was like, guess I can't go. And she says, well, no, actually, um, someone just donated the rest of the money for you. And I was like, are you kidding me? And and still to this day, like, I have no idea who that person was. But because an anonymous anonymous donor gave me like $1,500 to go on this trip, my entire life was changed. I can tell you truthfully that I would not be on this stage if I didn't get to go on that trip. That trip was God opening up the door to see what I could do to serve him. And it all started with someone deciding, you know what? This isn't my money. This is God's money. And this is what God wants me to do with his money. I'm telling you, when we're generous and we realize that God is the provider, that we are only stewards, and that he has true treasure for us, man, it's easy to open up our hearts say it's his and then see the life change that happens as we end i'd like to just go to one more scripture and um i think Gus brought this money this is all fake don't worry this is not real um i've been walking around with this and uh i kind of felt weird like just having it it looks really real but it's i promise you it's not um there's a lot of money right here a lot of fake money um there's one passage i'd love to go to and it is um in Revelation 21, 21, and, and a passage that's probably familiar to you. Um, John sees the vision of heaven at the end of Revelation, and, and he sees what it looks like at the very, very end when the people are there, and God is there, and everything is great. And it says, and the street of the city was pure as gold, transparent like glass. Anyone heard that verse before? That when we go to heaven, the streets are going to be there's going to be streets of gold. It's going to be pure like gold. Like, it's going to be amazing. And, and the thing that happens when, when we read Revelation is we think, that is so pretty. That is so incredible. And we read about rubies and sapphires everywhere and, like, the, the like rainbows and all this, like, stuff that's incredible, right? And we think, so beautiful. But I, I think that maybe that's not how the original readers hear this because we hear gold we think jewelry but they hear gold they think money right they think valuable they think currency um so this is what they think they think that the money is going to be on the street and that people are going to walk on the money When the original readers read Revelation, they heard streets of gold, streets, things that people step on, things that people walk on. This is what they see, this image. And what they see is, you're telling me that the thing that controls the world right now, gold, the thing that has oppressed me, the thing that everyone is fighting over, the thing that everyone says, I want more of, I want more of, this thing right here is going to be so invaluable in heaven that people will literally walk on it. 
that it will be stripped of all of its value, of all of its power. It will truly be absolutely meaningless, only value in the way it looks. That's what they read. They see citizens of heaven walking on $100 bills because the dollar has truly lost all of its power in heaven because in heaven that money that we hold so dearly now is truly meaningless it only has power it only has meaning for today and it has true eternal meaning and power when you decide it's not mine it's god's my hope is in your giving and your generosity you can change your mindset to not thinking of money and giving in an earthly way or in an American way, but thinking of it with that heavenly mindset, knowing that eventually the money that we hold so dear is truly going to be not valuable, truly going to be worthless. So my hope is that you could give joyfully with a heavenly mindset, knowing that this money doesn't mean anything, Ultimately, that all it is is something to hold on to. But what's powerful is when we give it to God, we can see the life change that he can do through it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, you're good. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. Lord, when it comes to money, we are people who can be hard of heart. We are people who can be stingy we are people who can who can hold on to it god help us not as paul writes put our hopes in our wealth but help us put our hope in you help us follow the way of generosity that jesus set out for us and help us give in a way to your kingdom that changes lives this we pray in jesus name and everybody said